central bank mandates and their limitations. Jens van Kloster, Adam Tooth, and many others pointed to the notion of authoritation gaps and the lack of clear democratic guidance. Hence, the question about central bank legitimacy and accountability is key, I would say. Accordingly, I'm very happy to welcome the three speakers in this session. Elsa Masok is a, PhD, a postdoc sorry, at the Center for Advanced Studies on the Foundations of Law and Finance at Frankfurt University. Lea Downey is a PhD candidate at Harvard University and a visiting scholar at the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute. And Leo hoffmann Axthelm. Um, um, is the Eurozone Governance Coordinator for Transparency International EU. According to my person, I'm a visiting professor for political economy and global governance at Wittenherdeck University. I'm working on central bank policies, shadow bank system, and social economic transformation. Um, to this session, please, but you've, well, everyone is, uh, knows this, please mute your mics as long as you're not talking. It would be fantastic because this is a workshop now to look into more faces. So hands, if it's possible, if you can, if you want, switch on your cameras, because I mean, it's a kind of different atmosphere to really have faces in front of us, yeah? And, um, so what are we going to do? We start with the presentations in a row, yeah? And afterwards we open up the discussion. If you have a question or a comment, please just write questions question or comment in the chat, yeah? And I'll collect you. Um, and I very much would like to ask you to post the question by yourself. I can read them aloud, but that is much nicer than. So I collect the questions and afterwards um, we can then um, have a Q&A session with the speakers. By the way, this session will be recorded. Okay, um, Azar, so you're the first, please. The floor is yours. Hey. Thank you. So let me share my screen. Okay. So thanks for inviting me and thanks for organizing this great conference. So my short presentation does not focus uh, on central banks per se. Uh, it, fo it focuses on how the interventions of central banks and governments have blurred the conventional missions of the banking system and have fostered some kind of problematic gray zone in terms of banks' uh, accountability. It builds on my research mostly in the European context. So what happened with the COVID crisis? Basically, the economy stopped and uh, there have been ma massive interventions by the central banks and the governments for, uh, in order for the banks to continue to provide liquidity to um, firms, to struggling firms, and, ma and basically maintaining maintain them alive throughout the crisis. So uh, banks' job, among other things, but uh, banks' job is to assess price and bear credit risks. So in the context of a global pandemic, banks would, have, would not have granted a huge amount of uh, loans to struggling firms in emergency with no uh, clear um, horizon for economic recovery. So there were these public interventions to assign new missions uh, of banks, which was for banks, which was basically maintaining um, firms uh, alive. But to have banks to continue to lend in this context, you have to withhold their traditional conventional mechanisms of private accountability in normal times, banks are accountable to their shareholders um, through transparency in terms of their risk strategy and what's in their balance sheets and also through in our current paradigm uh, shareholder value maximization. They're also accountable to their customers, uh, to borrowers through a good assessment of their uh, capacity to pay back the loans that they've been granted. Of course, these accountability mechanisms are completely not compatible with uh, providing liquidity in emergency uh, to a maximum of struggling firms. So public authorities have, we have, have um, put, the, put these uh, make, uh, accountability mechanisms on hold. For instance, in terms of share accountability to shareholders, the relaxation of capital requirements and uh, reporting created some kinds of uh, opacity in balance sheets and the ban on dividends have also resulted in like withholding this um, uh, accountability mechanism to uh, shareholders. So 
Public interventions uh, have put conventional missions and accountability of banks on hold, and banks have actually fulfilled a public mission, keeping firms alive. And we are in a typical case of uh, public-led uh, allocation uh, of credits. With that comes costs and risks to the public. We can think of the increased um, balance sheet of the central banks, whether it's a problem or, or not, has been discussed in the conference, but now it's a public uh, debate. And we can think of non-performing loans and the potential activation of public guarantee. And of course, always the Damocles sword of uh, banks' public bailouts. And yet, even though we're in a, a clear situation of public led allocation of credit, there is still a mixed message regarding banks' mission during uh, the COVID uh, crisis, um, both in the public and the private sector. So on one side, it, it was quite clear that banks were here to distribute a product of general interests, that they were acting as a public service. But on the other side, there is still this discord that banks' risk assessment remain essential, that framework remains market competition, and that banks are not public service firms. So these are based on my uh, research and interviews and, and, and discourse analysis in media. So here, really, we, we are seeing some a mixed message for, for sure, but also some kind of cognitive dissonance, both in the public and the private sectors. So, Have we lost Elsa? Okay, yeah, it, it seems so. Sorry for that. Elsa had told us that there's a problem with her internet. Um, I suggest to um, maybe wait 10 seconds and otherwise we are just going on with Leah, and we hope that Elzazan will come back later on. But let's give her some seconds. No, she's out. Okay, Leah, could you now jump in? I mean, that's that's how it is with the internet. <laughs> we have to improvise, but- um, sure. so, you yes? might, so should I go ahead and start my presentation? I would say so, yeah. And then we ask later on Elsa to restart again. Okay, okay. Thank no you. Problem. Let me just share my screen and we will get going. Okay. Fantastic. Great. Okay. So, um, all right. Uh, just to say thank you first for having me. This has been such a fantastic conference um, and a, an amazing group of people and, and great group of topics. So I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, and as a political theorist, my interest is primarily in the role of central banks and monetary policy makers um, in the democratic context. So, you know, we've heard in this conference and obviously elsewhere, a lot of discussions of democratic legitimacy. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that means. And in particular, not just can independent central banks be democratically legitimate, but I'm very interested in the question how does an embrace of central bank independence influence the health of democracy over time? Um, just to flag briefly, my primary uh, expertise is in the US case with the Fed, but what I'm gonna say here is mostly theoretical, so it should travel um, quite well, especially to the ECB um, with its unique independence, although perhaps complicated a bit by the relationship between various democratic sovereigns and monetary policy in the Eurozone. But we can come back to that in the uh, discussion. So, um, to start with central bank independence, so most sophisticated analyses of uh, sort of the democratic status of central bank independence start with the observation that embracing central bank in independence is fundamentally a question for the legislature, right? So this must be true, right? As the primary uh, democratic authority in society, it's up to the legislature to decide, right? Um, if the state will embrace a system of central bank independence or not, right? So the legislature or the, this literature goes on to argue that the legislature can legitimately delegate monetary policy powers 
to an independent central bank through a system of what I will describe here as something like guardrails and compliance, right? So guardrails are things like the legislative mandate, right? And compliance are compliance mechanisms are those that allow us to hold the central bank accountable to those guardrails, right? So think legislative hearings and things like that. So essentially we get a system of accountability in the form of guardrails and compliance that can secure the democratic legitimacy of central bank independence, okay? So this argument is rather compelling, but as I will very briefly argue here, I think it's actually insufficient from a democratic perspective, right? So the choice to delegate by guardrails and compliance may offer us democratic legitimacy, but it can still be a threat to the health of the democracy over time. And so to see this, I think we have to start with um, understanding the distinction between accountability and power, okay? So accountability is fundamentally a backwards looking uh, mechanism, right? So you hold someone accountable for something that they've already done, right? So we can see in the literature and political science, accountability has sort of three pieces. One is transparency, right? So to hold someone accountable, you have to know what they've done. Uh, one is clear standards, which I've called guardrails here, right? You have to know what they're allowed to do. Um, and then potential sanctions, okay? So in seeing that structure of accountability becomes rather clear that this is about sort of preserving the integrity of the status quo, right? So holding someone accountable to existing guardrails. Now, in contrast, consider power, right? Which is much more forward-looking project, right? It's affecting change, making decisions. And we can see the difference uh, really clearly between accountability and power, I think, when we consider elections, an example. So there's some debate in the literature, but I think it's quite clear that elections are fundamentally uh, examples of power rather than accountability, right? So when you elect someone, you're choosing, the society is choosing who will occupy that office, right? So it's not about holding people accountable for what they've done in the past. That's a matter largely for courts um, and sometimes legislature as we're seeing in the US today. Um, but it's not about, um, sorry, elections are about, not about holding someone accountable for what they've done in the past. They're about choosing what, who will be in office in the future. That's not to say the past obviously doesn't factor in, but it factor in, factors in as information um, uh, that one uses to make a decision about the future, okay? All right, so with that distinction in mind, um, we can move on and I will suggest that accountability while good and potentially even necessary for a, a solid system of democratic governments, governance, it's not sufficient, right? And it's not sufficient for maintaining a healthy democracy over time. Why is that? Well, that's because as I've just explained, accountability can offer us um, through a system of guardrails and compliance, the ability to secure democratic legitimacy, but as a fundamentally backward looking endeavor, it can't offer us a mechanism for promoting or securing democratic power, right? So insofar as we think that democratic power is fundamental to uh, the health of the democracy, then a system of guardrails and compliance like the one outlined here will be insufficient, right? So to return to central bank independence, um, most contemporary accounts justify central bank independence in the democratic context by appeal to accountability, usually in the form of this guardrails and compliance type approach. And that's because their primary concern tends to be the democratic legitimacy of the institution. But as I say, if we care also about democratic power and the health of the democracy over time, then we need more than democratic legitimacy, right? And therefore we need more than accountability through guardrails and compliance. Um, what that might look like, I have argued sort of in more de depth elsewhere and happy to talk about in the discussion, um, but essentially I suggest that um, democratic power and maintaining it over time requires regular engagement of the le legislature with the terms and conditions of delegation. Um, I call this a process of iterative governance, right? And that is fundamentally at odds with the insulation that we see um, in central bank independence. So what that means is it suggests that central bank independence may be able to offer us democratic legitimacy, right? And yet still be ultimately a threat to the health of the democracy over time. And therefore perhaps it's not worth uh, embracing, but that's an extra step that we can discuss. I'll leave it there for now in, in uh, pursuit of 
quick presentations. Thank you so much, Leah. That was absolutely in time. Fantastic. Um, Elsa. Um, yep. I'm sorry. We try it again. Yeah. I suggest that you switch off the camera while yeah. doing the presentation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's get back to it. Okay, so I was just saying that um, no formal process uh, mechanisms of public accountability, but informal mechan uh, mechanisms of accountability have developed. Banks are playing along there with talking about moral obligation, gentleman agreement, mutual understanding. And actually, don't get me wrong, um, informal mechanisms of uh, accountability uh, between uh, public authorities and banks can be very strong and it goes in both directions. So during the COVID crisis, banks have played along, they have fulfilled uh, quite effectively their mission of public interests and also um, their expectations on the other side. And here I'm just reading very quickly the quotes, uh, very revealing quotes from a banker. Here, governments have been pushing banks to dig into their capital ratios. Banks are playing alone. Under these conditions, it will be very difficult to leave a bank in the resolution regime. We will be in a situation of bailout measures and flexibility. So in short, massive public interventions have changed bank missions and withheld normal mechanisms of private accountability. We are in a public led allocation of credit, yet uh, the public mission is not formalized and they're mostly, they are mostly informal public accountability mechanisms. Mechanisms. So the question now is, uh, is it a problem? And perhaps it's not a problem because uh, the measures, the public interventions have been successful in maintaining firms uh, alive. So during the crisis, we can say, okay, it's been effective. And also it's temporary. It's just a one-time one thing. So there is no need to create complex, heavy institutions to formalize public allocation of credit and democratic accountability because we won't need them anymore when things get back uh, to, to normal. Normal. And um, well, this line of discussion has been present across the whole conference and perhaps it's one of the main sources of disagreement about the role of a central bank. Uh, but can we seriously think that things are getting back to normal? Uh, groundbreaking crises related to climate change, natural disasters are ahead of us and not in a time horizon of 100 years, but rather 10 years. So there are very serious signals that uh, to cope with this crisis, mechanisms of public led allocation of resources, including credits are required on the longer term and on a bigger scale than just one punctual rel relatively short crisis. And so if this is the case, uh, the current situation is really not satisfying. Bricolage, crisis management, and public allocation of credit may work punctually, but not, uh, they are not economically and socially sustainable on the longer term. And bricolage accountability is, of course, not democratically sustainable. So the questions that are open uh, are what to do about it. So. Um, we, we can't debate accountability of actors without clarifying their missions, their objectives first. So I think that first we need to clarify and formalize the missions of public banking and make explicit the boundaries between private bankings and public banking. And then create institutions that guarantee the de democratic accountability for uh, public led credit allocation. Thank you and sorry again for the technical problems. Okay. Thank you so much, Elsa. Um, okay, Leo, please. Thank you very much. Hang on, just sharing my screen here. Now it should be full screen. All right, so um, I'm joining from uh, Transparency International where we've also looked at the independence and democratic accountability of uh, the European Central Bank. It's maybe a bit uh, weird as a, an anti-corruption organization, but we did get involved in Eurozone governance uh, in the depths of the Euro crisis, given that things were going, getting a bit out of hand. And so we produced a series of uh, reports on each of the economic governance institutions at e EU level. That's the Eurogroup, the European Investment Bank, the European Stability Mechanism, and of course, the most interesting one, the European Central Bank. And, um, we called this report uh, two sides of the same coin, uh, but of course, with a question mark, it was a bit of a joke, given that this is how the ECB characterizes its own accountability and says, oh, yeah, so independence accountability works fine, two sides of the same coin, really 
natural symbiotic relationship. Uh, and obviously, accountability and independence are exact opposites. They cannot coexist uh, in, in any natural way, uh, given that the independence of the ECB is such that we simply cannot speak of an accountability framework for the ECB. Uh, Lea actually included a, a nice definition of accountability, which as a third element had sanctions, and there is no possibility whatsoever to sanction the ECB. Uh, they would have to uh, engage in gross, corrupt or criminal behavior for the ECB to itself propose to sue a member of the executive board and then wait for the Court of Justice to remove them. So this is quite a high bar to, to uh, you know, hold the ECB to account uh, when it comes to that. Uh, nevertheless, we looked into detail into how they went beyond their mandate during the crisis. And what we diagnosed was not so much independence, but rather institutional loneliness, given that um, much of the stretching and breaking of the mandate that was going on at the ECB was due to the fact that, that no other institution was bothering to protect the euro and that fiscal policy was completely absent in, in the crisis response. So, um, of course, this is an issue that goes much beyond the ECB and its mandate. Uh, and also from the topics that have worked so far, it's clear that back then in 2017, the issues we looked at were more overreach in, ter in terms of the Troika, uh, or threatening letters that the ECB was writing to, to Ireland, Spain, uh, Italy, uh, and not so much the, the let's say, the more uh, positive uh, mandate stretching that the ECB is engaging in uh, as of late with, with um, uh, trying to uh, safeguard liquidity for, for sovereigns and with um, um, improving the, the framework for, sust um, for a greener finance and for a sustainable finance framework. So, um, of course, we made a lot of proposals also on how to strengthen the democratic mandate uh, of the ECB. Um, we put a lot of emphasis also on the subsidiary mandate, given that we also felt that the ECB could do more to, to support um, other parts of the economy and not just uh, be narrowly uh, minded on inflation. All bearing in mind that this would, of course, require even more democratic accountability, given that the ECB would then uh, have more uh, tools at its disposal. Um, and generally speaking, I have to say that ECB at the beginning was an extremely difficult institution to, uh, to work with, given that they had such a broad viewing of their independence that basically they felt they were not accountable, as it were, to civil society actors. So it was even difficult to meet them, to get the, the interviews in the diary. There was months and months of confidence building measures involved. And since then, I feel that they have really opened up significantly. So things like the ECB listens event and lots of roundtables that the ECB has been doing in, in the last years, I think would not have been thinkable in those times. And uh, we're actually trying to push the ECB further um, to also institute an annual civil society dialogue forum, uh, similar to what the Fed is doing or the European Investment Bank, so as to really also get a lot more feedback from civil society as that is, I think, useful to anchor also democratic expectations within the bank. Um, the ECB even invited me to, to address uh, all of the Essex offices from the national central banks, given that they, of course, need buy-in from the national central banks in order to change many of their rules. Um, however, they were, didn't like our uh, reform proposals on democratic accountability, given that there, of course, it's more about losing control and about really uh, significant questions for the ECB. And rather, what they chose to focus on was the many uh, reform recommendations we made on integrity. Now, I'm not going to bore you with that, but basically, there was a lot of changes. Uh, the ECB took a, a minimalist role in the Troika. They introduced a new emergency liquidity assistance policy. Um, they were more transparent in their holdings of corporate bonds. Uh, they completely reformed the ECB audit committee, which only had former um, um, uh, governors uh, on, on board. And they just introduced a whistleblowing policy, which is very good, uh, given that this is all the more necessary for such an independent institution. Um, but uh, on other aspects, the ECB didn't move much. So, um, of course, it's becoming very, basically the, the main problem remains that the ECB hides behind a pretense that all of its action is technical and that there's no political trade-offs whatsoever involved in all the uh, things that it's doing, right? And of course, this is necessary from, from the guardrail mentality because if they admit that their mandate involves political trade-offs, then they also admit that there is a need to reform the independence and to uh, subject them to greater democratic accountability. Um, and, and that's all fine and I understand that, but there's two things that we need to bear in mind here. 
One is that the structural incentives for the ECB did not change. So the constitutional uh, setting in which the ECB moves and decides is still the same in which the ECB was blackmailing Italy, Ireland, and Spain. And it's still the same under which the ECB used and abused emergency liquidity assistance in order to extract concessions from Greece, for example. Um, so they won't do that right now because they also learn from their mistakes. Nevertheless, they totally can do that again if, if they so wish, right? Um, and then hiding their own discretion behind this pretense of, of, uh, of uh, technocracy um, is also not going to fly if you are going to try to really improve things going forward. So if we're going to embrace a completely new monetary policy paradigm, and if we're going to push for a fiscal framework that uh, takes account of the fact that we no longer have the high interest rate environment of the 1990s and of the Maastricht Treaty, this is really going to be a provocation from the, the point of view of a German Central Bank or the point of view of the German Constitutional Court and all of their allies, right? So this is really going to stretch the mandate to breaking point. So if we are going to continue this very positive notion of really using the ECB as a tool in confronting climate change and of really going into uh, a monetary fiscal coordination that actually enables all the investments that we need in social and uh, environmental sustainability, then we, I think we need um, to take up some of these proposals on uh, giving the ECB the political cover that it needs from the Eurogroup, from the European Parliament, in order to go ahead uh, with these uh, revolutionary uh, thoughts. And I think uh, Benjamin Brown and, and uh, Jens van Kloster made very good uh, um, suggestions in, in that regard as well uh, in, in this conference. And I should also acknowledge that Benjamin Brown was the lead author on our ECB report there. And then the last thing I still wanted to, to say uh, um, in, in closing, uh, is that, of course, the ECB also picks itself when it wants to be independent, right? This is part of the independence is that they self-define the independence to some degree. And this means that they get to hang out with the Eurogroup as much as they want to, even though the Eurogroup as an informal institution, of course, is very much on the fiscal side of things. Here we see them at their 20th anniversary. And uh, and that's fine for Mario Draghi now when he's going to be in the European Council as, as Prime Minister of Italy. But he was in the European Council for eight years already whenever they discussed economic governance. And so, of course, uh, it's, it's a bit, um, you know, it's, it's positive that there's some coordination, I suppose, but it sits awkwardly with the ECB's own claims of, of their perfect independence from, from uh, all the other uh, economic governance institutions. Thank you very much, Leo. Okay, um, so um, let's stop the presentation mode and let's start the discussion. Um, I've so far just one comment from David Archer and um, a question whether Leah could have another minute to, <laughs> to finish her presentation. Um, if the, there are no, so I would say, so Leah, we do that, yeah? It's because there was a demand for that. So, um, so you found a left, but please then let's jump directly into this discussion, okay? And I would, I'm happy to answer any questions. So I'm, I've pretty much finished. Um, I mean, the, the conclusion is, is, as I say, just that um, despite the fact that there are good arguments uh, defending central bank independence on the basis of democratic legitimacy, um, those arguments fail uh, to offer this sort of source of democratic power, which I posit is actually fundamental to a healthy democracy over time. And it relates to what Leah was saying um, as well, where, you know, if we want to be um, doing, making radical change going forward, uh, if, if we believe, right, that monetary policy has not been perfected, as some may have posited in the 90s, and that it will need to change in the future, um, then we have to have uh, democratic mechanisms for it to change, right? And that's when I've offered this uh, suggestion, sort of gesture toward the suggestion of iterative governance uh, system that is fundamentally in contrast to central bank independence. And I can talk more about that if people want to hear about, more about that. I also have a paper on that that I can post. In yes, the chat. please. So now the questions are coming, which is fantastic. Um, Antonio, please. Hi. Uh... Thanks. Um, I would like to raise the question to Leah. So um, I guess that your your point of view is basically grounded on a majoritarian model of democracy, very 
parliamentarian dependent. And, and I would I last like, like to ask you a question based on that model and one, if you adopt a different conception of democracy. So going to your, uh, still your point that uh, um, the, the power version of democracy or the power aspect depends on an iteration and uh, subordination the, uh, to the legislative. I think that uh, it is probably very hard to stand the um, democratic credentials for the ECB, but not, for instance, to the Fed or to the Bank of England. Their mandate can be amended easily by, by, by the parliamentary and uh, legislative body. And they actually have to report. They, are, um, they have hearings frequently. And they have what uh, Sarah Binder, I, I don't know if you, you know her book, uh, as called uh, Interdependent Relationship and the Myth of the um, Independence. So um, there is actually a feedback and uh, a sanction. I disagree with Leo on that point. It's not uh, punishment on the job but it definitely can be um, a punishment in terms of mandate, purse, the audit of Fed initiatives, for instance. So even in your uh, major majoritarian model, I think there is ground to say that that feedback process actually through the legislative uh, branch uh, feeds um, a lot of uh, input, the democratic input to the, to the central bank. But I will also like to ask you whether if one accepts or prefers the non-majoritarian model conception of democracy, wouldn't central banks what could be not only um, the, the, the legitimate and democratically recognized as a power, but actually contribute to the health of democracy? And I, there are two or three points on that. One is, Contrary to courts, for instance, they have no finality in terms of their power. So what I mean by this is, for instance, the Supreme Courts, they can decide at last instance. It doesn't happen with, with central banks outside. I would say the ECB is a different case because the amendment of the, the treaties makes it much more difficult. Then you, you will have all this discussion on non-majoritarian uh, arguments like Moravitz made about the European Union where you can see there are inputs from the dialogue directly from the EC, between the ECB and the people and um, the advantages of specialization and so on. So if you adopt a different concept of a model of democracy, wouldn't your conclusion change? Thank you, Thank you a lot, Antonio. Um, okay, Stefan, please. Yes, thank you. I hope I'm audible because I haven't got my headset on. Is that all right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I just thought, and Antonio's question alludes to that too, um, and uh, so that, uh, that different central banks in different countries have different structures of boards. So an extreme example is I lived for a while in, in New Zealand. They have just this one governor who decides everything and the, uh, the other people on the board are just advisory. Um, in, in, the, in the Fed, you have this federal structures and you, you have uh, a combination of commercial bankers and, and uh, more public servants. Um, in uh, the same you have in the, in the Bank of England. And uh, so ideas for making it more democratic. So could this be uh, to have not just experts um, in the board of governance, so, uh, but, but elected people from representing different sections of society? So that would, uh, uh, that would also um, work against this uh, con uh, expertocracy that uh, Leo mentioned. And or, and or do, do we have to have better procedures of how these, if we, need, if we decide or if it's decided that it needs to be money policy experts or people coming from banking because you need the expertise on the board, then do we need a clearer democratic processes how these board members are actually chosen that it's not just the finance minister picking them um, and, and that they're, they're replaced from time to time and nobody knows why yeah some some women go some women come so I, 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 I I'm in England now I'm, a, I'm an economist at the University of Leeds um, and as though German as my 
come across yeah. my accent. Um, that that uh, I, I, as, as a feminist economist, I also I, I had an eye on on their board, and and there was always this token woman there, um, if if it, if there was a token woman, and 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 so so more input, social input on uh, the 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 composition of the board, can that make it more democratic, and then rules for that, which which really might, I think put, is 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 what I say is representing your argument about. Uh, democratic power, I think. So it's, it's already reflected uh, in general, but sort of more details, you know, or in what way are you thinking? Uh, that would be my question there. Should Thank I you. For too long, sorry. Should stop. Thank you, Stefan. No, the question is clear. Thank you. Um, David. David Archer. You, you had a longer comment. Um, uh, he has no microphone, but he formulated quite a clear question there in the chat. Yes. So, um, well, I, I have to find it. Before that, Pavlos, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I was I was expecting that quick. Um, sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Everyone. Um, very fantastic um, presentations. I have to apologize, start by apologizing to Elsa because you got cut off in the beginning and then I got cut off when you came back in. So I haven't really heard your presentation and I'm really sorry about that. I don't, I don't have any comments for you. Um, but I have a, a two, like one comment which is kind of brings Leah's and, and Leo's together in a way. Um, so I was, I, was really, I was really fascinated by this idea um, that you introduced Leah in the beginning where you said that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about legitimacy and accountability, that the, the act itself of deciding central bank independence is a legislative decision, right? So it, there is a sense of, of legitimacy in the initial kind of decision, which is sometimes um, get forgot, gets forgotten in these discussions about legitimacy and accountability. But when, in saying that, what it reminded me of um, is one of the, um, some of the, the earliest supporters of central bank independence, the, the German or the liberals, right? Um, who understood central bank independence as a way of imitating as best as possible the gold standard, which they preferred, right? An idea, that an external anchor, some kind of like automatic mechanism that works as a way of insulating economic policy from any kind of democratic pressures. So if the gold standard was abandoned precisely because universal suffrage um, could not be sustainable with the gold standard, for the, the liberals at the time, central bank independence became the best possible way of replicating that kind of um, mechanism. So from the beginning, and I would say until now, which is obvious from the discussions we're having, the idea itself of central bank independence is, if not hostile, entirely ambiguous towards democratic accountability. So in, in part of this whole discussion, and also Jens paper um, from, from yesterday and, and, and Benjamin, not yesterday, today, actually, but it seems like a long time ago. Um, <laughs> all this discussion about democratic legitimacy, while maintaining central bank independence, in my, in, in my view, doesn't make um, a lot of sense. And it's, of course, it's, it's extremely radical when you, when you come up and you have a discussions with the ECB or someone to say, well, first of all, we're going to get rid of your independence. But at the same time, I don't see any theoretical or methodological way of maintaining central bank independence while at the same time urging for um, democratic accountability. And that kind of relates in closing with, with Leo's comment, um, because you mentioned like ways of maybe somehow enhancing accountability. And one of the examples you gave was the Eurogroup. And, and that was, for me, that was a bit like, because I haven't read your report, I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure your report about the Eurogroup describes very well how the It's, it's absolutely scathing, yeah. like so the antithesis of uh, democracy, yeah, exactly. blocking each other by unanimity and, and, and exactly. uh, the rule of the jungle and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the institutional loneliness of the ECB is very much, you know, um, um, perfected at the, at the level of the European Union. And, and the Eurogroup is, is, is hardly... Like the, the, the way to, to bring that, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that that's not exactly what you meant, but I was just a bit surprised about that. But okay, I can okay. I, I stop here and, and thanks. Thank you, Pavlos. Um, so th 
thanks for Leo. And now we have the question uh, from David. And of course, it's, it's absolutely fine when you don't have a mic. I can just read it aloud. So the question was for Leo. How can we do you simultaneously expand the ECB mandate, give the ECB additional political cover and fill the accountability gap? Could this be at all consistent with continued in independence on the thing they were intended to be independent on? Or does this thing have little value now? OK, and I have another question or remark by um, Stricke. Is this right, Stricke? In, indeed, yes. Please. OK, so um, first of all, looking from the inside, I'm inside the ECB. Hi, Leo. We have worked before together. Uh, and uh, the point is what we always say is we have a democratic deficit, and we know. So the point is, if we talk about accountability, the question is really, is there accountability? Yes, our president goes to hearings. Uh, yes, we get uh, other forms, but uh, we can take the advice we receive. We are not necessarily bound by it. So the question is, what kind of accountability is there really? Who controls us? Um, honestly, it's officially the executive board is, is controlled by the governing council. Six members of, of the governing council are actually the executive board. And quite a number of the governors on the governing council would love to become an, one of the next executive board members. That's how far the club atmosphere goes. Uh, then again, as a remark, if you look into the CVs of our current board members, our uh, actually, our vice president uh, once upon a time belonged to a now belonged to Lehman Brothers, and then was a finance minister, and then went straight into the ECB. So uh, this is again, if you look at it, there is a quite a mix of people there. And yes, uh, accountability needs to be balanced with independence. You, it is in our mind, in in my mind, it it is. Uh, you cannot have both at the same time. So, but the question is, if we want a more democratic institution, we will need to give up some of the independence. It's that simple. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I think these were quite many questions. And although there's no question, ah, there's another one from Stefan. You would like to pose it now, so before we start the... Um... Okay, I can do this very quickly. It's, yeah. it's just referring to what Stricker just described as uh, the career moves of one of the ECB board members. Uh, you know, do, do we need to restrict that? Is that is, isn't that corrupting um, when the, the, the independence, when, when there is such a strong link to commercial banks? But you also have that structurally in the, F, in, in the, in the Fed anyway, with commercial bankers just... And, and, and government in, uh, institutions is working hand in hand. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much. So I would like to say that, oh no, Ulas. Okay, please. Get, that's the chance because I think if you have the answering round, then might, the time might be over. So uh, please. Thank you, Yosha, for this. I don't, can you hear me? Yes, you can yeah, hear me. Very well. Thanks. Uh, and thanks for the speakers. and. Uh, um, also for organizing these panels. Uh, I wanted to uh, support Pablo's point because he, uh, after reading Daniela Gabor's article and, uh, and the hypothesis put forward by Jens uh, in his paper that maybe we can push for a more progressive agenda without challenging the independence of the central banks. I think this, is not, this will not be possible uh, because central banks only have relative autonomy and uh, all their actions are framed in this political agenda. And we will not have a substantial uh, change, um, of course, without challenging this uh, central bank independence. And, and there uh, many points were put forward and I just wanted to highlight this uh, fact. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward for further discussions. So thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe just a very short, question from my side to all of the speakers. I mean, during the conference, we, I, I think rightly so, question the notion of the independent mandate of the central banks. At the same time, there seems to be the view that uh, if we question this, we have automatically a progressive politics 
But I mean, imagine <laughs> um, uh, Trump and other populist um, movements and uh, parties having the possibility to steer central banks much more strongly than they did. So just um, bring that on the floor, whether um, I see the point of the problematic of the independence, that's absolutely right, but is um, more dependent uh, uh, central bank politic, uh, and politics automatically more progressive? That's my question for all the speakers. And now, actually, I would like to give back the um, round to the presenters. And I would actually like to stick to the row. So, Elsa, if you could start, like pick up some of the questions or just add some comments to that, then Leah and then Leo, please. Yeah, well, of course, there, there was there was a question about uh, whether it's uh, what I'm describing is encouragement of credit liquidity or really credit allocation. And that's a very good question. I'm just uh, going to answer it very quickly. Um, you're right that it's not like allocation of credit in the sense of a coherent industrial policy, although uh, there was, uh, you know, targeting of small firms uh, for specific programs and also, also cer certain uh, specific deals that were, were clearly allocation of credit. But in both cases, the mechanisms of uh, public guarantees, public subsidies and uh, withholding of uh, accountability are the same in both cases. So, um, like if we are to tackle climate change, but also social consequences of natural disasters, we'll have these uh, mechanisms implemented in the future. So, um, the, and, and also like just a, a point, these, um, these mechanisms that I've described are actually like uh, more common than just in the crisis. They've, they've been actually, they're being, they are being used all the time, right? So. Uh, whether it's uh, encouragement of credit liquidity or more specific credit allocation, the question still holds, uh, mm -hmm. sort of. And just very quickly, so uh, about your uh, question, um, Josha, you're, you're completely right about the, the progressive and we have historical um, examples of why, uh, you know, uh, central banks dependency uh, could be problematic and these examples really need to be uh, we really need to keep them in mind and when we are talking about you know designing new institutions of accountability we need to have these uh, examples in mind i think that the reproach of uh, mostly central bankers saying oh these guys don't know what they're talking about but we know history right so you're completely right we have examples of you know populist governments fascistic governments like using um, um, monetary policies uh, for like extremely non-progressive um, uh, objectives. And however, now we're in a situation where we really need to tackle like extremely dangerous, uh, extremely uh, important uh, challenges. We are in a situation where populism is growing because of these uh, in, in intertwinement uh, between private and public sectors. And even though uh, central bankers are saying that they're independent, they are like in, in the, 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 the pe in people's minds, like these kind of, you know, hip hybrid uh, reality between banks, central banks and politicians, that is very problematic. So even though there is this risk and we need to keep that in mind while while designing uh, democratic institutions what is the alternative you know so uh, it's a little bit uh, a, a question that i would like to get back to to the people saying okay you 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 you're not aware that the the monetary policies can be used for bad purposes so what 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 shall, what shall we do what are the alternatives for that Thank you, Elsa. And there was another question exactly for you in the chat, whether you consider whether you consider the conditions attached to the bank refinancing within the TLTRO, which is the targeted long-term refinancing operations um, framework as a form of accountability or private banks activities. Maybe you could just say a sentence to that. Um, Elsa, you're muted. Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, sh sure. So, the, of course, like the, the independence is often like uh, thought uh, in terms of independence uh, from politicians and from governments. And uh, the question of uh, the dependency 
the interdependency between central banks and, and commercial banks are extremely uh, extremely uh, important too and and um, obviously and Benjamin Brown uh, have uh, also developed this uh, question uh, yes there are accountability processes between central banks and commercial banks that need to be explicitly uh, stated and formalized. Thank you a lot, Elsa. So we jump to Leah and please, could you also have a look because they're jumping up new questions, but because of time, maybe you just read them by yourself and, and while you're answering, integrating them in your answer. <laughs> Leah, please. Sure, no problem. Um, okay, let's see what I can get to. So thank you for the fantastic questions. Those are all um, really spot on and very interesting. And I think one way to sort of answer a couple of them in one go, particularly um, Antonio and Pavlos uh, address sort of those questions together, is to think about the analogy that's commonly used in the literature about uh, central bank independence as Ulysses tying himself to the mast, right, to avoid the siren calls of uh, improper uh, spending and inflation and to maintain a sort of stance of, um, you know, the, the proper monetary policy stance. And so, uh, you know, that factors in here because it must be, as I say, within the, le within the legislature's democratic power to decide to attempt to tie itself to the mast, right? That has to be within their power. Um, however, it doesn't mean that doing so is actually something that is good for the health of the democracy over time, right? So this gets to the point, I think, that Pablos mentioned where, yeah, I think it's completely democratically legitimate to make that decision. That doesn't mean I think it's the right decision for the democracy, right? So that, that is where the tension comes in between central bank independence and um, democratic power that I was trying to bring out. Furthermore, in relation to Antonio's point, in the case of the US, it's actually impossible for the legislature to uh, effectively tie itself to the mast, um, barring constitutional change, right? So you're absolutely right that they have the formal power to just abolish the Fed tomorrow or change the mandate, right? So, you know, you can't tie yourself to a mast because if you do it yourself, you can always untie, right? So that's kind of the point. And I recognize that, um, that they have that formal power, however, in having effectively tied themselves to the mast for the, this many years, their actual, um, rather their formal power remains, but their effective power to stay involved in monetary policy has massively atrophied, I would argue. So I actually reject the binder and spindle argument that you mentioned from the book, The Myth of, in of Independence, because most of the hearings that you see, um, if you watch them of the of the Fed chair in Congress, are largely matters of guardrails, right? So why aren't you doing this? And then the Fed chair says, well, that's not within my mandate, this kind of thing back and forth over and over again. So it's less a discussion of how should we structure monetary policy in society and more, are you kind of doing your job? Um, and so I actually think that the despite the fact that the formal power remains in the US, the effective power has largely disappeared. Um, and that's the, the key issue um, for me. And then finally to, to get to Stefan's point, I think that it is absolutely correct to put a point to the, um, the lack of diversity and particularly the influence of financial, private financial powers, particularly in the US, in the leadership of these central banks. Um, and there are very good arguments for changing that. <laughs> However, I actually see that as a slightly different matter to the one that I'm arguing about with democratic power, because I see the democratic power argument as one that has to support um, increasing the legislature's power over the central bank in particular, because that's how the people sort of as sovereign end up controlling it. Whereas sort of increased influence from civil society, while good, is not sort of a replacement for that democratic power. Um, it's the same response I have to people who say, well, the Fed is holding all these events and now the ECB, this review, and they're listening to more people. And I think that's great, but it's by no means a substitute for, um, for what, I'm, what I'm promoting. And then finally, I'll just say to the last point about populist control, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I think that that is, totally a possibility and that increasing democratic power over institutions like this, especially in a country like mine where the legislature is full of 
crazy people right now, um, some of them, that is uh, a, a scary thing to embrace. Nevertheless, I think Elsa's exactly right. What's the alternative, right? I mean, to me, I, I believe fundamentally in democratic power and in a democracy. And I, I would hope that, I actually posit that, part of the reason that the legislatures can become so recalcitrant and sort of performative um, rather than you know, sober governance institutions is because so much power has been delegated away from that institution. It becomes so much easier to perform, right? Trump has no um, real control over monetary policy. So he can say, let's, or m much of other policy. So let's just tell Mexico to pay for our wall, right? Like he has no personal sort of skin in that game. So I'm hoping actually a higher degree of democratic power might actually influence positively a little bit in the in the other direction um i'll leave it there so we can hear from leo as well thank you so much leah i mean there's now the chat uh, many things but i think now we really have to go to uh, leo our last speaker and maybe try to include some of the points i think it's really an interesting, very interesting discussion yeah, absolutely. No, very, uh, very interesting, relevant points. I'm going to try and cover as many as possible. Uh, starting out with a very brief one. There was the idea of having a non-independent central bank with a right-wing populist. I think you can uh, check this out in Erdogan's Turkey. Uh, so that's that. Uh, I think it's a good point on um, giving parliaments powers uh, and, and then expecting them to rise to the occasion. This is what we've been consistently advocating on the Eurogroup, on the European Stability Mechanism, and so on and so forth, to just bring in the European Parliament in the European semester in the EU fiscal policy uh, uh, process. And uh, this will, of course, then also uh, make sure that uh, reputable and very knowledgeable MEPs will be present and will make sure that that uh, you know there's an adult conversation that one can uh, that one that is going to be up to the challenge task as well. Um, I thought the uh, um, I thought Mr. Stricker from the ECB made a very good example here of the kind of honest communication of trade-offs that I would expect from the ECB. Uh, given that elsewhere the ECB has a bunch of academics that write papers uh, trying to redefine accountability in such a way that is so minimalist that even the ECB can be defined as being totally accountable. Uh, and I think that's just not the way to have an adult conversation about uh, independence and accountability. So the way that we personally uh, uh, in NTI have done it is we've defined it as answerability, given that obviously the ECB has to answer questions in writing orally. So I think answerability is a really powerful instrument as well. And this is what the ECB currently has, but I wouldn't conflate it with uh, accountability. Now, uh, there was a very interesting question from David about, you know, are we really advocating for getting rid of independence uh, and, and how does that uh, work with, with increasing accountability? Well, I mean, I think we have to kind of uh, be a bit, uh, nuanced about what it is that we think is beyond uh, the mandate and what's not. So blackmailing sovereigns is, of course, not OK, right? But uh, having policies that overall give sovereigns more fiscal space to confront immediate social challenges, I think that's a much more benign policy stance uh, and, and can be much more easily justified. Um, now, claiming market neutrality in order to resist uh, greening finance or uh, is, is very contested because, of course, there is no such thing as market neutrality, and that already consists of choices. So certainly, I'm not advocating for the ECB to, you know, go beyond its mandate or go rogue or, or, or things like that. Um, and certainly, I would never argue for just abolishing uh, the independence or even uh, weakening it uh, beyond the point. Um, but we, this is not a theoretical argument about weakening uh, or strengthening ECB accountability, right? It already is making massive political choices all the time, even on things like collateral eligibility requirements or enforcing stability and growth pact rules uh, with, with the way that it defines um, uh, um, the, the uh, sovereigns. So we really need to acknowledge the things that uh, they're already doing beyond a narrow interpretation of the mandate. Uh, and all the political choices that are already inherent also to this mandate, given that the ECB doesn't have a dual mandate focusing on jobs and inflation, but really just targets inflation. So uh, this opens up the ECB to a lot of risks, given that it's already doing all of this political stuff. And these risks are also manifesting themselves because uh, this does, I mean, what we have to really avoid is that now actors like the German Constitutional Court 
uh, squatting the vacant spot of holding the ECB to account, right? I mean, this is not the way to do it. So the second best solution that we have come up with would be to have clear political mechanisms. And by political, I mean mechanisms short of constitutional change, um, whereby the Eurogroup, as imperfect as it is, but the Eurogroup are the fiscal uh, sovereigns and the European Parliament both have to agree among each other. And if they do agree among each other, then this would give political cover for the ECB to use the more wide ranging tools that frankly it's already using. So, so I think this covers the main points. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so, so much to Elsa, Leah and Leo. This was fantastic. I think it's super interesting and super important discussion. Thank you as well to the workshop participants. I mean, just imagine 10 years ago, would we have discussed about central bank independence? There were some people, but now it's really a front discussion. I think it's super important and it will accompany us in the next years. Hopefully there's changing something. Okay, time is over. There's um, a break now, coffee break, and I hand over to Markus for some organizational points. So thank you yes. to everyone. Thanks everyone. I mean, we had 50 people. This would have been a super crowded normal workshop room. So very happy and uh, thanks for all the comments. I put the link in here. It's a mingle tool. We tried it out yesterday. It's sort of fun. You can join and then there's sort of a virtual room and you can sort of mingle in a post workshop atmosphere with other people and meet them and go a bit around. That's uh, supposed to replace uh, the normal uh, conference atmosphere, having a coffee with other people. But you can, of course, just uh, take a break. And then in 15 minutes, we're back uh, with uh, in the main room for panels and uh, keynotes. Thank you.